good seasons there, man. They're a really strong team. A strong team. Okay. Going uh, live on Facebook in a couple of seconds. <clears throat> Sorry for the delay, by the way, guys. It was uh, okay. I think we're live on Facebook. Um, all right, welcome to Fans in Blue, episode eight. We've got a special guest today, Sushant Marathe, ex IPL player, um, Ranji Trophy player. So we've got uh, you know cricketing royalty in uh, in the midst. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna um, you know uh, read out your. T20 in, in the IPL, you played eight games, is that correct? No, not in the IPL. This was the Ranji Trophy T20. Right. Okay, got it. Um, overall T20, you scored 235 runs, which um, at an average of 34 and a high score of 90 not out, um, is actually a really, really high average for T20 cricket. Um, so you must have done something right. Um, and also, you played for India. <laughs> you also played for <laughs> India in the under-19 level. Um, and so in, in the IPL, um, really quick, uh, you played obviously Mumbai Indians. Um, how many seasons were you there? And then you were also part of the Kochi setup for a couple of seasons or one season? Yeah, so I, I was with the Mumbai Indians in 2010. Right. And I moved over to Kochi in 2011. Right. That was the only year that Kochi was in the IPL. Right. Uh, and then 12, 13, 14, I was with the Mumbai Indians again. Right. Um, so quite a long time, I mean, in that setup, um, I think the first thing, uh, Sushant, we kind of wanted to get, um, you know, uh, people who are watching this episode familiar with, and, you know, a lot of people actually don't, uh, know how the progression of a cricketer works in India. I mean, I can give you an example as a comparison, um, having grown up in, in Bombay, but also in, um, Auckland, um, in New Zealand, it's very straightforward. You play for your club all through from growing up, you, um, you play for your, maybe your first 11 of your school. Um, then you move on to men's cricket where you're playing for your club and there's many different grades, everything from social all the way up to super competitive um, Premier League cricket. And then from those top Premier sides, they pick the domestic side for Auckland. And from the six domestic sides, Auckland, Otago, et cetera, they pick the New Zealand side. Now mm -hmm. that for the layman is a fairly simple structure to understand and follow. I think most Indians will tell you who are cricket fans, they themselves don't know how it works in India. So kind of curious with some input, some Prahlad, who was your teammate back in the day in college cricket, um, you know, uh, but I'd love to hear sort of, you know, when you started off playing age group cricket, how did you make it to, you know, the Mumbai sides? How did you then progress on to, you know, the, uh, you know, the Ranji Trophy side and finally to the IPL? Sure. Um, so there is no set progression as such in India, but I can talk to, talk about how I sort of went through the ranks. Um, I started playing when I was 12 or 13. And then, um, but that time it was just like a, like a hobby. Like mom just put me in this coaching clinic, which was right next to my house because I was a slightly fat kid. So it was like a more of a way to, you know, make her son lose weight rather than having any sort of career aspirations for him. But um, I think things became a little more serious when I joined the Elf Wings Soccer Academy. Right. This was at when I was 13. And then pretty soon I played for the Bombay under 14s. So in terms of progression, that is the first level that a person can come in at. Um, and then... Um, after that, I joined Ari Podar College where I met Prahlad. Uh, we had some really good years over there. I played for the Mumbai under 16s after that, then the under 19s, then the under 23s, and then Ranji Trophy. So in terms of a linear progression, that would be it. But again, people have a lot of people haven't played junior cricket, but straight away came and played Ranji Trophy or didn't play Ranji Trophy and did well in the India under 19 setup and got picked up for the Indian team. So there's no fixed pattern. Uh, that's the bottom line. The, the two questions that come to me from that are, number one, um, how much did the Elf and Soccer Academy help with uh, your exposure? Um, and the second question is, um, what do you think you did that set you apart? It could be scored runs in trial games. It could be consistently performed at a certain level. Um, it could be that they were looking for a certain style of player and you fit that bill. But, you know, curious to hear what was your sort of um, X factor. 
Um, in terms of the exposure, that was huge. That was my first real taste of, you know, seeing the big names in cricket coming and practicing next to us. Like at the time, we had used to have Ajit uh, Ajit Agarkar used to come and practice over there. Jatin Paranspe. Um, you know, we used to have a lot of India players who used to be in town come and practice. Yuvraj Singh used to come and practice over there. Um, so just to see those people in, in like life, flesh and blood, literally practice next to you was a huge high as a 12, 13 year old, as you might suspect. Um, in terms of what set me apart, I don't think there was anything that set me apart. It's just that I had a decent enough game, nothing to like, um, nothing that was like, you know, spectacular or anything. It just that I was a wicket keeper and a batsman. So I thought that came in handy where I had two faculties I could rely upon. Um, and yeah, Bombay has always been on the lookout for a good wicket keeper batsman. So I thought that's what uh, they saw in me and then they groomed me afterwards. Well, I'd like to jump in there and Sushant is being particularly modest here. You know? So, uh, so when Sushant came to Podar and that was my first interaction with him as, as a cricketer and as a person, uh, he, because he played under uh, 14, 16 uh, and usually Podar used to be a very strong team at that time. But Sushant was already kind of identified in your mark for somebody who would go on to play higher level cricket. Uh, so he was extremely good for his age. And also, you have to uh, look at it in the context of how Mumbai and Indian cricket was at that time. And Sushant kind of fit in the Gilchrist mold because he was kind of an attacking left-hander, uh, wicket-keeping batsman, which, and, and, you know, we have spoken about this in the past as well, how uh, India earlier used to have a wicket keeper who was primarily a wicket keeper and not a batsman. Correct. And they were always looking for people who had a strong batting faculty to contribute to the batting lineup. And Sushant was one of those who was a stronger batsman starting out than a wicket keeper, if I may say that. Uh, but over the years, he had to work a lot on his wicket keeping to complement his really attacking stroke play. Uh, and uh, and maybe, you know, I'm also maybe saying this from a perspective that I played uh, cricket maybe I, I, between 2000 and 2005 when T20 was not around or we didn't even know that T20 would be around. But Sushant's game, when I look back in hindsight, was the perfect foil for playing short version, aggressive cricket. He could hit uh, the lofted shot very well. And, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sushant, you know, I remember when, when we used to play... Uh, in the nets also, um, Sushant has a particular shot that he plays at cow corner, which people his age did not play, and especially with that kind of power. So right. uh, Sushant might say that he did not do uh, something out of the ordinary to catch the eye of people, but there were certain things about Sushant that definitely uh, told you that this fellow had something more than the average wicketkeeper batsman that you would see in Mumbai at that. That's, that's phenomenal. Uh, Sushant, I'd like you to sort of, uh, you know, maybe build on that a little bit and tell us sort of, um, you know, perhaps what some of the selectors who you interacted with, um, you know, told you about, you know, in terms of positive feedback about your game. And actually, quite frankly, even curious to hear where they asked you to maybe improve on as you were going up the ranks of, you know, under 16, under 18 cricket. Yeah, Um I think um, Prahlad just spoke about it briefly that I was always a batsman primarily growing up and then wicket keeping was something I had to really work on whereas I was, whereas I was a more natural, naturally gifted batsman. So the feedback from the selectors is to always be focused on your wicket keeping, you know, just um, spend more time in the nets working on your keeping drills and make sure you're physically equipped to do the, to do, to do the job, like focus on more agility drills and flexibility, etc. Because I was a was always a kind of a stocky guy. So uh, that was the feedback I got. But in terms of whether they gave me any sort of positive inputs, not really. That's not how it works. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course. The lines of communication aren't really as well established as they should be between selectors and players, unfortunately. Right. But yeah, certainly um, I used to get a lot of things to improve on. Uh, maybe not necessarily from the selectors, but that used to be like, from other players, other senior players, teammates, the coaches I had at various points um, in college cricket or even playing for the junior teams in Bombay. 
Vedang, by the way, feel free to jump in if you have a question. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Sushant, uh, I mean, uh, as I told you before, I, I, I've or, or seen you around at CCI quite a bit. Uh, but uh, my only thing is because India, because in India, cricket is such a popular sport. I mean, is there a lot of, and you know, as an outsider, I mean, I don't know the details at all, obviously, and you would have more of an insight out there. Is, it, is there a lot of politics which happens, you know, uh, in the selection, be it the Ranji team, be it the Bombay team, be it the IPL? I mean, you know, because this is what people are generally wary about, you know, in uh, uh, the Indian cricket uh, setup. So, if you could throw some light, if it's confidential, obviously, I mean, uh, uh, you're free not to comment on those things. But if you could throw some light on that, please. Yeah, look, I'd be lying if I said there is no politics at all. Um, but having said that, you know, I just feel that whichever profession has a certain degree of fame and money and, you know, if I could say power attached to it, there is bound to be, you know, a certain level of politics as well that one needs to, you know, tied over. But in cricket, um, if you, I mean, it's, it's hard to, um, it's hard to suppress a player who's, who's really good, you know. So, I mean, no matter what the level of politics was, you could have never kept uh, Sachin Tendulkar suppressed for too long or a Rohit Sharma. Uh, right. But wherever there's like a Unnis Biska Fesla, then maybe right. there is where, you know, that politics would come into play. All right, fair, fair. I have a um, kind of a the question kind of related to what Prahlad was saying, which is, so you were going up the ranks as an age group cricketer, you know, as Prahlad rightly said, you were earmarked to play higher level of cricket, right? Um, the, the question I have is how much did college cricket help you with that? Um, was that sort of a tangential thing to the fact that you were already playing, you know, under 18 or, or under 19 cricket at that time? Um, or did that experience really help sort of develop you as a mature player? Curious to understand kind of how you viewed that sort of leg of your uh, cricketing journey. Yeah, so college cricket was huge in my career. It was massive because um, before college cricket, I used to still view cricket as a, as a hobby that I was good at. Uh, I come from a very academic family. So, you know, pursuing cricket as a career was, was really never considered in my family or like I never considered myself either. Um, but when I came to Podar and, you know, when I started playing with people like Prahlad and we used to have some other really good players as well, that's when, A, the quality of bowlers and, and players I was, I was facing, that, that really picked up and hence my game improved as well. And um, we had a terrific coach, uh, the much celebrated B.S. Patil sir. So, um, I think he really shaped me as a cricketer. Um, and lastly, I think just the habit of getting big runs as a batsman. That's something I developed playing college cricket. I remember um, I used to get a lot of hundreds in college cricket and I never used to get that earlier. So they say that, you know, getting big runs is a habit and that's a habit which I, which I think I developed playing college cricket. I'll, I'll chime in a little bit over here. And, you know, this is, uh, and Nikhil, Nikhil, this is to your point also that how do you get identified in Mumbai cricket in general? So after, as in, Mumbai has one of the most robust schools cricket systems. So a right. lot, lot of people uh, don't give enough value to the Giles and the Harris Shield. Harris Shield, yeah. Basically uh, identifies you at that age group category. Uh, then the next thing is to play college cricket. And college cricket is where, you know, you come into a slightly more challenging league of people and players. And Podar at that time, or even today for, for the most part, you know, is one of the leading colleges in terms of uh, college cricket. Right. Okay? So we used to have, so uh, Mumbai cricket is kind of divided into, you know, two or three different zones, if I may say, and, you know, Shushant, you can correct me if you, uh, if I'm saying something, misspeaking, if, if I may. Uh, so on one side of the other is uh, Matunga. So you have that school of cricket, which is primarily, uh, you know, Poda, as in the rank says, you know, you start at IES. <laughs> And graduate to playing for Podar, or you play on this side of the Tilak Bridge, as they say. <laughs> and on the other side is Shivaji Park. And from Shivaji Park, you have the you know the people who play for Shadashram, 
graduate to play for Ruparel. And so there's this inherent rivalry at the school level that's across the bridge, at the college level that's across the bridge, and then at the club level, erstwhile Shivaji Park versus Dadar Union, which is also like across the bridge uh, kind of cricket rivalry. Over the years, we're seeing these centers emerge in the suburbs where you've got the colleges like Risby uh, and, you know, the likes who are becoming great powerhouses for uh, college level cricket in, uh, in, in Mumbai. But Podar, Ruparel and this whole uh, Dadar Shivaji Park area has produced these middle class cricketers who, you know, come from very humble backgrounds, but play on the sheer force of their talent and emerge as solid cricketers. So Podar was one of those fertile grounds and to not stress enough the importance of this gentleman called V.S. Patil, who I think most of us revere as, as a coach who shaped our lives, not just on the field, but outside as well. Um, so that person, and it, it's, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a recent event, one of my friends posted a picture of him uh, on Facebook, you know, commemorating the contribution that he's made to uh, Mumbai cricket. Uh, but Poda used to be that place where you got identified. And once you played well at the college level, automatically you got picked for these top clubs. And Sushant used to play for the other union as well. And so that's where you got identified to play A division club cricket, as they would say at the time, and uh, graduate to playing men's cricket, the equivalent of what you would call it, what you were mentioning in Auckland. Uh, so that's a great uh, explanation. I want Sushant to kind of comment on two things related to that. One is, you know, um, from a uh, progression perspective, you seem like you fit the bill with all those things that Prahlad talked about, right? You you played for the right uh, college team, you perform well there, you played for the right club. Um, from there, you were perhaps noticed and then, you know, got involved in Ranji setup, etc. Um, the question I have for you is, um, how many people are outside that system and have immense talent um, who are not being noticed, or maybe the same question could be asked differently as well. Um, you know, is it that you need to play at certain schools and colleges if you want to progress your cricketing career in Mumbai? Um, I suppose that would have been the case earlier. Um, I would say a few years back, but as Prala rightly said earlier, we used to have these cricket centers, which used to be Primarily towards South Bombay, Shivaji Park, Azad Maidan, the Oval Maidan, where all things are right. kind of worse. And now cricket's moved north more and more. So you have a lot of these academies springing up in Kandivli, Borivli, even like far from places like Virar, for that matter. So I think now the chances of not having access to quality coaching are, of, are a lot lesser than what they were earlier. So earlier, you know, probably if I hadn't been to Podar, I wouldn't have, you know, been able to progress in the ranks. But now I think the chances are a lot lesser than that. That's a super point, uh, actually, uh, Nikhil. And, you know, this is also a little bit to do with how uh, cricket administration has also changed in Mumbai. Uh, so earlier you would, you know, if you saw a promising talent, so, so I'm telling my, my own experience. I, I grew up in Navi Mumbai. Which, is, uh, which was not a good center of cricket back in the day. So when I finished my 10th grade, the first thing that people told me was, you know, you got to move to a college that's, you know, really solid in terms of its cricketing culture. And therefore, I moved to Podar to get that experience and the exposure. Today, if you see Navi Mumbai, it's emerged as a super hub for cricket with the D.Y. Patel Academy and, you know, all, all the infrastructure that it brings, the kind of coaches it brings and the kind of quality surfaces you get to play uh, as compared to what you had earlier. Uh, so, and this is also, as I said, related to the administration of cricket as well as office bearers in the Mumbai Cricket Association came from cricket moved from traditional centers to the suburbs. Uh, you know, I remember playing at Azad Maidan, Cross Maidan, Oval Maidan. You yeah. played, there were 50 matches going on at the same time, right? Uh, now, with the new centers coming up in the suburbs, you have better grounds. You have you know, more independent fields where you can play cricket as opposed to crowded areas. As in, I, sometimes when I look back at you know, my cricketing days, I feel that you know, coming out of it without any major injury, uh, as in not caused by your own game, but you know, somebody yeah. playing next to you and hitting a ball on you, 
uh, it's quite surreal that nobody has had uh, such drastic and drastic and fatal injuries that you should have. I remember being field at point in my game, but I'm not yeah. just hot leg in the next game. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was about to say that. Uh, yeah, and not many people who play outside of Mumbai realize the kind of uh, you know cricket culture that this brings with it. Uh, so, and just to add to that from a final perspective, because those matches happen in such close proximity with each other, you get noticed. Uh, you know, because you there are ten matches going on when everybody is going out to lunch. They are you know checking the scorecards of every game as they walk along, and they say, okay, fine. You know, Sushant playing at uh, national uh, CC or as, as, at the national ground at one edge of the cross maidan is about a hundred, but everybody right up to Karnataka CC right at the other end will know that okay, fine, there's a hundred that was scored at national this morning. You no, know? so that that's how word goes around in lovely, and nobody nobody would say that you know as Sushant was saying that if you score and if you get runs by the dozen, your name gets spoken about and you get noticed one way or the other. Uh, and you know, um, and I'll, I'll come to some part of you know Mumbai cricket eventually when we come to that point. Uh, but I have some really interesting questions because Sushant has been on that straddle of uh, old school cricket in the early 2000s to what it has become in Mumbai now. So he can probably give us some really interesting insights about the evolution of that game. Then. Fantastic. No, that was a, that was really really uh, helpful. I think for people who kind of have not gone through that process i think they it'd be uh, it's a really uh, granular way to explain that which i think people would, would really appreciate listening to um you know the other thing i wanted to pick your brain on sushant uh maybe one or two things that uh, vs patel your coach at podar kind of told you about before we sort of move on to your uh, journey with uh, you know the ranji side Wow, there were plenty actually. Um, but if I had to pick two things that I really learned from him, uh, the first thing would be discipline. And I'm sure Prahlad agrees with me. The practice used to start at seven. If you came late, you probably didn't get batting that, that day. It was it was as simple as that. No matter if you were the best batsman in the team or the worst, you just would not get batting or bowl, bowling if you were a bowler. And the second thing was, um, unlike most coaches um, at the time in, in club cricket or college cricket, if you want to talk about it, he stressed the least on technique. He was a great proponent of letting your natural ability take over and, you know, just going out there and expressing yourself as they say nowadays. But that's, that's something that he almost encouraged without putting there as many words. So if I had to pick... The, the two things that come to mind instantly, these would be the two. And just on that second point really quick, um, you know, uh, I guess it, from the understanding uh, that we've gained of your game, you know, being sort of the, the uh, Mumbai Gilchrist, um, I guess having that ability to um, just play the way that you want to play and not be constrained by a coach who told you to perhaps change your game or play according to a situation or, you know, um, have like a slightly different mindset to what you were used to probably benefited your game quite a lot. Yeah, it, it certainly did. Um, during, so during my junior days, so playing under 16s and under 19s, I was never bound down by technique or, you know, playing how someone expected me to play. I would just come, I would just go out there and just play natural uh, cricket. And I, I think that translated into me scoring a lot more runs consistently. And all these other things, all these added pressures and playing according to the situation of the game, etc. Don't get me wrong, is very, very important in the higher class of cricket that you play. But all these other things only came in when I, you know, made my debut for the, the Ranji Trophy side where, you know, you had to play according to the situation of the game. There were a lot more people in your ears telling you, you know, as an opener, just play out the new ball. Uh, don't try and play attacking cricket. Play the Khadus cricket as, as Mumbai is known for, rightfully so. Um, so yeah, all these things, I think, just came on a lot later in my career. Uh, I just wanted to jump in out here. Uh, Sushant, uh, how, now that you're playing in England, how would you compare playing in India since you played a majority of your cricket in India. 
to the level which you played in England, say in the various clubs which you played in England? I mean, how would you compare? How is it different? Uh, your experience on that? I mean, I to be fair, I'm not playing professionally now, so the league I'm playing in is not um, well. I would say the the best standard that you would get in in, in England. Uh, but the things that make it difficult over here is is the pitches and the overall weather conditions, etc. The ball tends to move a lot more than what it would in India. So um, a bowler which is who's not as great can still get away with, you know, a few rubbish deliveries. Uh, but I, I don't think it's it'll be a fair comparison because I haven't really played that standard of cricket in, in England. So Sushant, okay. let me take you back to Mumbai cricket a little bit. And you know, so um, I remember you know the years that we played together at Dadar Union. Uh, the environment was very different. The cricket culture was very different. Dadar Union was a particular kind of school of cricket, if you may. Yeah. Uh, but what I've been following Mumbai cricket over the years, just you know, maybe I've been living in the US for a while. <laughs> Do keep track of what's happening in domestic and local cricket. Uh, so I remember the Kanga League as being this, you know, huge passage of uh, batting batsmanship, if you may. And, mm -hmm. and I remember times when you would have, uh, the, you know, a two-inning game compressed within a day, where the first team gets out for 50, the next team get out, the second they get out for 30, and you know, you've got a full result in a game. And yeah. so from that context. To become maybe the first double centurion in in Kanga League to uh, make that massive 232, if I have not wrong, uh, within a day where most teams would basically score half of that by losing 40 wickets, right? So just tell me a little bit about how that transition happened, uh, and you know how Mumbai cricket has become more attacking over the years. I've seen, you know, limited overs, Talim Shield matches, which you know, people score 350 runs. You've got a double hundred in that as well. So just talk about that a little bit and how from going to technically correct, play the ball along the ground, kind of school of batsmanship to uh, express yourself and, you know, if it's there to ball. Let me talk about Kanga League firstly and let me try and give a bit of context about what the tournament is firstly. So Kanga League is a tournament played in the monsoons. Like literally as it's pouring down, you play cricket, which does not happen otherwise. Um, so firstly, the 200 that I made was when the Kanga League had shifted to a dry weather tournament. So we had flat pitches. Uh, the opposition wasn't that threatening either. So and otherwise... 200... Uh... Sure, sure. But I'm just saying that in the typical Kanga League, there was no chance anyone can get it up around it. Definitely not me. Um, but Kanga League was a very unique tournament where um, the bowler held all the aces just because it was raining, the ball used to swing around, the pitches were wet and hence um, I would say pretty dangerous to play on because the ball would just like you would go to play a forward defense and the ball would be on your helmet sometimes. It was insane. Um, but what it did teach you was to, you know, be really resilient um, where literally everything, all the, all the factors were going against you as a batsman, but you still had to somehow dig in, survive, try and figure out a way to get run somehow. That's something which I feel that you know, it needs to be reintroduced in Mumbai cricket because from the, the last I heard, they've stopped playing the Kanga League altogether. Um, but yeah, it was it was a really, really tough but extremely good learning ground. Um, and alluding to um, Dadar Union, where we played together, Pralat, we had some really good players in our ranks, right? Sangram, Bagul and all those players. Uh, so just to see and how they countered those situations, you actually could learn a lot batting at the other end as well. Uh, which, uh, yeah, which unknowingly definitely helped me a lot in my career. And I want to sort of ju ju jump in there one second, Prahlad. Um, uh, for the uh, sort of people who don't know the Kanga League and kind of, uh, you know, just giving a little bit more context to what Prahlad said earlier. Um, if a team, you know, what would you say on a difficult Kanga League wicket was a good score? And if you came back after being out and let's say, a ball that was completely unplayable conditions kind of meant that, you know, the ball moved around and, you know, suddenly shot down on the deck when you had no chance. 
Um, mm-hmm. So let's say you walk back into the pavilion and your captain pats you on the back. How much would you have scored? <laughs> um, I would say 15, 20. Yeah, that's what I, I was thinking. I, I would tend to agree. And, you know, so the only rule I would say in Kanga League would be that don't get out to a bad shot. You know, uh, you you had to grind. You had to show that you had the tenacity to, as Sushant was mentioning, negotiate that tough period. Uh, you had you had to have the ability to uh, play or, you know, kind of negotiate an unplayable delivery. And if you got out, you got out. But, uh, but if you got out playing an uppish drive, that would be looked down upon as opposed to, you know, you playing a forward defense and the ball popping up and taking the edge of your bat and going somewhere. And to that point that, you know, Sushant was mentioning about you know, the ball moving around, the, condi- the pitches being slightly soft, not slightly, quite soft, where they would take a chunk of the mud with it. That was probably the reason why so many Mumbai cricketers did so well in England uh, in, the, in the earlier years. Uh, because no matter what you would say, this was the closest that they would get to those kind of muggy conditions as they do get in, in, in England. Right. And for, for a club like Dadar Union, there, there are stories where, you know, Sunil Gavaskar would come, you know, land at the airport, yeah. uh, just, you know, pick up his whites from home and come and turn up for a game at Dadar Union just because that was the kind of culture and environment of playing Kanga League cricket during those times. It has changed quite a bit, and I'm not one of those who's going to say that we were in, back in the day and things like that. But uh, th- these were kind of, it's not just from the cricketing perspective, but these are uh, characteristics that they were imbibed and you know inculcated in people at a very young age, that people would show up for these club games and play with as much pride and dedication as they would for an international. So, and that's important by being in those dressing rooms at that age, to understand how an ex-player who's played for India would treat a club-level game. So you played with the same tenacity, you put a price on your wicket, and you did not give up in, in those kind of circumstances. Yeah, uh, yeah I'll second that. I want to um, move along to, um, you know, Ranji Trophy cricket. Um, kind of, uh, you, you briefly mentioned there that, um, you know, what came into play was... Um, contextual batting, you know, playing for the situation, people in your ears giving you a lot of advice. Um, you know, maybe uh, starting off with kind of who were some of the more influential um, seniors or, or sort of more established players um, at the time when you were playing um, and perhaps one person you learned a lot from and, you know, maybe one or two anecdotes from that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so when I came into the side, uh, some of the more established players in the team were people like Nilesh Kulkarni, Amul Muzumdar, um, Sairaj Bautile, um, Ramesh Powar, Ajit Agarkar. Yeah, so they were the more established players. Um, in terms we're of, talking like mid-2000s? I made my debut, if I remember correctly, 2006. Nilesh was the captain, um, yeah, yeah, 2006. In terms of people who I learned a lot from, you obviously learned a lot from watching your seniors go about their game, their preparations, etc. But I was someone who actually learned a lot from all my players. Um, so obviously, I used to have a lot of conversations with someone like an Ajit. Um, him and I got along really well. Uh, we spoke a lot about cricket and preparation, I would try and sort of be that sponge to learn um, from his international experiences, etc. But equally, I learned a lot from, say, an Abhishek Nair or a Rohit Sharma or a Sahil Kukreja, who was my opening uh, partner at the time. So I don't think learning is only restricted to, you know, your senior players, because um, there are certain things that, I mean, for example, if I had to learn the art of batting, I don't think a player like Sachin <laughs> Tendulkar or Ricky Ponting would necessarily be the best coach because right. I'm not, I'm like 5% of the talent that those guys have. So perhaps I don't think I can, sorry, they can't put themselves in my shoes right. as, as well as someone like a Nair or Sahil or um, Rohit Sharma can. So I think I learned 
equally from all the players around me. Any of you want to jump in with questions? So, uh, Sushant, so I want to ask you a little bit about how you are as a the transition, right, from club and college level cricket to the Ranji side. Right. How was it uh, challenging from the quality of cricket f- uh, from that perspective? Uh, second, I would say that, you know, uh, just getting part of that coveted Mumbai environment, which, you know, adds sometimes unnecessary pressure on a player because yeah. you, you've got to win the Ranji Trophy. It's not, you know, if you yeah. come second, it's a bad season. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, so, so that perspective. And then do you think that, you know, as you mentioned that you had your peers in Nair, Rohit Sharma, Sahil, Kukreja, etc. Uh, did you feel that you needed a mentor at that stage to help you transition better from uh, schools, college, uh, club cricket to the Ranjina? Absolutely. Um, and I'm a big advocate of having mentors in place for young aspiring cricketers because I think there are certain things that you just can't talk about with your coach or you know your captain or sort of senior members of your side because there's always that that fear of being judged or you know looked down upon uh, for the lack of a better term. Um, and personally, every time I had like a informal mentor in place, that's when I performed the best as well. Um, sorry, Pralad, I forgot what your question was, but I think it I was, was. I was asking you about the transition from that level to the Ranji level, and you. Yeah. You touched upon the role of a mentor to help you that, but yeah. tell us about the difference in the quality of cricket from one to the other. The quality was huge because I remember I got picked up to the so I, my first call to the Ranji Trophy side was off the back of um, a pretty impressive under 22 season. Um, and from getting runs by the bucket load, I went into the Mumbai Ranji Trophy side and I feel I felt like I could not hit a single ball. It was so, just to give you some sort of context, my Ranji Trophy debut, I got out of my first ball. Um, it was caught at forward short leg of this bowler called JP Yadav, who also played a few games for India. Off spinner? No, he was a medium pacer. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking of Jayant Yadav. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was the second over of the game. The first over, I saw my opening partner getting beaten five out of the six balls he faced against a bowler called Harvinder Singh, who also yeah. played for India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, Seema, yeah. There was definitely a big gulf in standard that I'd faced earlier to what I faced in the Ranji Trophy side. Um, but also, I suppose, what contributed was the fact that I was playing on a very lively Wankhede uh, stadium pitch. Uh, a fresh Wankhede day one pitch is something which is as tough a test as anyone, any batsman can encounter, let alone a debutant. So, my debut wasn't um, according to plan. I'm, then I'm, assuming, I'm assuming that Mumbai lost the toss or was it to capitalize a sound situation? Oh, no, no. We lost the toss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, can't, I can't imagine a single captain who would have won the toss and batted on that pitch. Um, but I got a few runs in this. How about, how about the pressure of playing for a top side like Mumbai? Huge. Huge. As you rightly said, the expectation is that you're going to go and win the Ranji Trophy. Like, making it through to the playoffs or even, you know, uh, losing a closely fought finals is still considered a very bad season. And there are some serious repercussions for everyone involved, you know, be it the support staff or the players directly. So, the standards are very, uh, very high. And I, I, I remember certain practice sessions used to be as hard, if not harder, than the actual games. People used to really, really push in practice sessions. Uh, we used to have some pretty challenging uh, pitches to bat on as well. So, um, yeah, the the gauntlet was laid down pretty pretty early on. Who was uh, the uh, toughest bowler to face in the nets? Would it have been Ajit Agarkar or you know perhaps one of the spinners? Um, who did you find the most challenging? Um, so the season I made my debut, Ajit wasn't playing. Uh, we had Avishkar Salvi, who also yeah. played for India. He, played for him. he was unplayable, man. He was, um, yeah, he was one of the one of the best bowlers I've ever faced um, in my career. Then we also had a guy called um, Rajesh Varma, who used to bowl these sharp in swingers 
uh, pretty nippy at the time. Played a lot for CCI, uh, Vedan. Um, okay. He was he was pretty tough to uh, bat against in the nets. But I mean, in in Mumbai, we had Sapnil Hazare, who also did really well for for Mumbai. Yeah, but it's just that in Mumbai you had no dearth of um, quality bowlers. Um, Ramesh Pawar troubled me a lot in the nets, um, and the few times I played against him in the time shield where he played for Tata, I played for Air India. He almost always got me out. So um, yeah, there was some there was some really quality quality bowlers to face. And that's the time he was playing for India as well, right? I might recall he went yeah. to that England tour in two thousand seven. Yeah. He had just come back from the India tour that time. Wait, had he played for India? Can't remember, but he was there or thereabouts. Yeah, he was at the I top of the to really, really England and Pakistan that time. Yeah, uh, Ramesh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and to to the point, you know, uh, Nikhil, uh, what what Sushant is saying is really true from perspective that domestic cricket or local cricket in Mumbai, all these guys to show up to play for their clubs and their corporate sides. So right, you you've got to play these people. uh in club cricket you know uh, zahir khan would show up for a game uh you know avishkar salvi swapnil hazare all these people who uh, sushant just mentioned were at the top of their uh, cricketing prowess from a bowling perspective and these all these guys were in the reckoning to uh, play a higher level as as you know and maybe if if uh, you know some of the opportunities that that came much later in the game had come in a few years earlier you, these names would also have been part of our general recollection and not just uh, mumbai cricket folklore if, if i may and uh, you know when when the national cricket academy first started uh, back back in the day all these people were part of the first groups of uh, players who went and trained at the national cricket academy during that time and all of them were part of the elks uh, elf bensakar academy set up where uh, you could see these people playing uh, you know cricket day in day out yeah um i want to briefly touch on um india under 19 could you just walk us through sort of that experience and then you know uh, i'd obviously like to talk about the ipl sure so um i was in the reckoning to um play in the india under 19 world cup i was actually the first standby uh so it was a toss up between dinesh karthik and myself and um very rightfully the selectors picked dinesh karthik as the eventual um uh, person in the 15 member squad but then the uh, following year i got a chance to play against the touring england side um in the one day internationals um it was a really good experience we had venkatesh prasad as our coach manoj tiwari uh, was our captain uh, that team was really talented we had rohit sharma we had piyush chawla um I'm sure I'm missing a few Robin, people here fast fast for the robin utappa right. um i think was yeah. was raina raina from the same group as well uh, raina was from the same group but i think at the time he was i think if i remember correctly it already made it to the india side i may be getting this wrong um but he made it to the india side pretty much immediately after the under 19 world cup um So yeah, it was it was a really good experience. It was a nice, like my first taste of playing with with people from different parts of the country rather than against them. Um, yeah, it was a good learning experience. Venkatesh Prasad was a top-notch coach as well. Um, overall, pretty positive. So a lot of people actually, um, you know, um, maybe who aren't as astute followers of the game. Um, probably would discount that right i mean you know prasad has played for india at the highest level and you know mm-hmm. um, taken a number of wickets but not remembered as one of india's uh, best or top fast bowlers uh, mm-hmm. why did you like him as a coach and and what uh, what did he add to your game yeah um i think it's very hard for me to um reconcile with what a normal person would would look at like how a normal person would look at a, at a as a at a certain player because for me venkatesh prasad was a top notch international cricketer you know so i didn't look at him as someone who was wasn't as successful as someone else for that matter i still looked at it as an opportunity where i could actually learn a lot from him um you know in those two weeks that we were, we were together um i can't remember if i learned anything specific from him but just the way he spoke about in team meetings uh, strategizing about games um 
just his mindset was was very unique um i can't it was many years back when i can't remember exactly what what i picked up and an excellent point that sushant make there you know so whenever an aspiring or serious cricketer in in the mumbai or indian circuit would meet an india international no matter whether that person has uh, lit the international stage on fire or not that's the person that you still want to emulate right it doesn't matter how many five wicket hauls or how many centuries they've scored but they made it to the indian team and the odds of doing that are so low that right. even if it's a one game person or a five game person uh, it doesn't matter or if a hundred game person you know so when you got to meet a venkatesh prasad or you know even people who played far lesser cricket than venkatesh prasad has for india you would be like you know give me all that you got i am the fountain and you you're at the fountain and you're supposed to drink from that fountain so that's a really interesting point uh, because uh, and i i don't want to say much about the coaching aspect because you know different coaches work for different people but the aspect that you got to sit next to an india cricketer and talk to him about the game <clears throat> how many people get that chance right no Absolutely. that that's a yeah. that's a great point um IPL uh can you talk us through um you know you were there for a, a few different seasons the in Mumbai Indians um what was the um sort of when did you get the call you know were you expecting it um you know kind of walk us through the initial sort of stages of that yeah so i had a couple of um like decent ish seasons in the ranji trophy that's when i got my first call to play for bombay uh, to play for mumbai indians that was 2010 but uh, we had a huge squad that uh, that year if you remember we had about like 30 40 players so didn't really make it to the um, to the more truncated squad uh, but it was my first taste of you know practicing alongside international players uh, even i didn't practice a lot that year but it was still um, you know a, a huge learning curve nonetheless but my first real taste was 2011 when i went to kochi and you know we had people like murli dharan and uh, brendan mccallum we had um, who else did we have we had quite an interest uh, maila jayawardene all the jayawardene yeah so just like looking at how they went about preparing for their game how they went, how they approached an, a, a single net session that was something that you could learn immensely um and then mumbai indians 12 13 14 were absolute game changers for me because that was when i actually felt part of a squad because i was traveling consistently with the side i was in the dugouts even though i wasn't playing um i always thought i had a chance to play so you know th- that makes you more sort of invested in the team uh, so that was when um i think the the true experience of the ipl kicked in for me so so sushant just to, just to build on that you know you you played age group cricket club college you know ranji trophy ipl uh what's been the best dressing room experiences for you have you felt as in, what you mentioned was by being part of that dugout during those years with mumbai indians feel more invested in the team what memories do you have from from your cricketing playing days what were the most me- memorable uh dressing room uh, camaraderies was it was it did you enjoy it because your team was winning more or was it because the group of people that you put together as a as a team uh, at whatever level of cricket you played look winning definitely helps <laughs> it's hard to keep enjoying yourself if your team's losing um i would say that the two experiences that stand out for me were winning the championship uh with the mumbai ranji trophy side in 2009 i think it was or 2009 or 10 where we won arguably the best ranji trophy final that's ever been played against uh, karnataka in mysore uh, mysore yeah Okay. Manish Pandey had got a 140, and then Ajit Agarkar just bowled out of his skin in the second innings uh, to get us home. That was that was a special, special dressing room to be a part of. Um, and then the 2013 IPL Championship that uh, Mumbai Indians won. That was a, a serious dressing room to be a part of. We had the likes of Sachin Tendulkar, Ponting. Uh, we had Malinga, Rohit Sharma. Um, yeah some absolute legends of the game were part of that uh, that particular side so it was a huge celebration but um just like the season itself was very very i mean i feel extremely privileged to be in a part of it 
and, and, and sorry, just the um, uh, talking about that 2013 IPL season. Um, you know, uh, what were um, and you were traveling with the team. You were in and around the dugout. You were playing sort of you know, alongside all these guys who are you know people watch on TV and and regard as the best. Um, I think you would once mentioned to me you were close uh, to Michael Hussey, if I'm not wrong, um, or are you you have sort of have like a, a relationship with him. I mean, uh, I wouldn't say close, but yeah, I mean we got along. So he just played for uh, he was there with the Mumbai Indians for a year, and right. that year we spent uh, a decent amount of, amount of time together. But I wouldn't call us close or anything. I, I would love to call uh, call Hussey a close friend, but sadly that's not the case. Right, right, right. But I guess the from a perspective of um, learning from him, you know, yeah. I always viewed him as someone who played the cover drive almost perfectly. You know, he, he yeah. played that textbook shot where he leans into the drive and, you know, like, yeah. you know, perfect maker's name of the bat. Um, what did you pick up from him? You know, maybe from like a T20 perspective or just like, you know, mental aspect of the game. Uh, I'd love to hear one or two sort of tidbits. Yeah, so... Hussey is one of the nicest people that I've met in my life. He's just so down to earth. Um, it's almost like you need to tell him that he's the Michael Hussey because he just has zero airs about himself. Um, I, I'd love to talk about technique, but I think that will be a bit of a boring conversation. So let me tell you one incident that happened in 2014 in Dubai, uh, where if you remember the first five games of the season, right. yeah. Dubai, it was the elections. So we were there for, I think, almost a month, including the practice before the, the tournament started. And I was just having um, breakfast with him uh, one day. And I just said, you know, I would love to talk to you about the mental side of the game if you have some time. And he said, sure, let's, uh, let's do it tomorrow uh, post breakfast before we go to training. So I thought it's just going to be one of those things where he comes and, you know, dishes out like, stay in the present, make every ball count, watch every ball like a hawk kind of a, a session. But he came in like prepared, man. He had this he had this big file that he carried with himself. And he said, you know, I'm going to make you do um, um, some psychological test or something, which um, his his coach, the, the coach who was to, um, I can't forget, what's his name? The 2005 Ashes coach. John Buchanan? John Buchanan, John Buchanan, yeah. John Buchanan. So he used to make yeah. all the new entrants to the Australian team go through that test. So he said, I'm going to make you do that test just to understand what's your personality type. And I was like flabbergasted, man. Here, you know, I'm talking to the Michael Hussey and he's putting in so much time. Like he spent about an hour and a half just trying to, you know, assess what kind of a personality type I am. And how I should then approach the game after, uh, you know, understanding what works for me. So um, I don't want to go too much into the details, but I thought that was that was really really helpful for me. And just like he, he used to he used to give a lot of positive reinforcements during the uh, net sessions. So him and I would be uh, training partners a lot of times where we would like chuck the ball to each other uh, at the end of the next sessions. And he would be someone who would like continuously, you know, keep encouraging you and, and um, you know, point out flaws as well, but at the same time also focus on certain positives you could better. But that looks like you have a question or can no, I jump I, in? I just want to, you know, emphasize and, you know, reiterate the role that a mentor can play in, in these kind of situations. And, and Sushant is bringing up points that are so critical that, you know, uh, cricketers who are you know still playing the game might benefit from uh, by just you know getting getting themselves the right the right kind of advice that they can you know take their games to the next level uh, to that point sushant uh, as in while growing up you might have been you know wanting to emulate somebody as you know in in your game as well through through your ipl journey did you meet any of your childhood heroes that you could uh, speak to them about uh, you know what what you wanted to be as as one of them or like yeah, sure. Um, like my my hero growing up was of course Sachin. Um, I was fortunate enough to share the dressing room with him for a few years. Um, in terms of a wicketkeeper batsman, uh, it was Adam Gilchrist, as you uh, pointed to earlier. Um, and I had the huge fortune of you know meeting him as well at an IPL um, after party. Actually, it was pretty interesting. 
where you know he was just trying to enjoy his beer and i was like this um i would imagine um, annoying little little guy who was going and asking him all his cricket related questions like how do you prefer uh, prepare for a game what was your mental makeup before the 2007 world cup finals 100 that you hit etc and he was like you know he was really he was really sweet and he was trying to entertain all the questions that i had for him but clearly you know his mind was elsewhere um and also i would say steve war and during the india under 19 tour that we had against india i met steve war at eden gardens i think i was i was quite star struck when i met him he was one of my idols growing up as well uh specifically um as it relates to sachin i know um kind of we had to ask the question but i guess uh you know uh did you learn anything from sachin about um you know uh game play or um like you talked about the mental side of the game did you spend any time with him on that yeah um i did but it was mostly technical um so he i used to go to him with if i had any technical issues um i would ask him but to be very honest with you i was really shy to go and ask him uh he like he's such a man he's on a different level compared to the rest of the guys so um it, it was more about just trying to pick his brains on certain things other than going for advice necessarily so 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 shan i i want to i want to you know bring it back a little bit in terms of your own game as such uh talk to us about what what you loved as you know an aspect of your batting that you could do that not many people around could uh you know as in one thing that as i said very early in our conversation uh, the the lofted shot over cow corner i had not seen anybody play before i saw you do that and with the kind of power that you had so how did that come about was it a natural thing that you got or what were the kind of strokes in your repertoire that you had as a player naturally and what did you work on a lot to acquire um so i wasn't a i wasn't a great um i wasn't a great technical player to begin with so like the the, the slog over cow corner as you said was just um, a natural shot that came to me because i was maybe batting with the wrong technique so it just meant that that was the one shot i could play well but what it meant was i possibly couldn't play the extra cover of the drive or i couldn't play like a good traditional cover michael hasi cover drive for that matter um i i don't i i don't know man if there's anything that i could do that anyone else couldn't i don't think so pralad maybe i can ask you this question um uh, just to clarify i'm trying to like make this mental uh, video in my head is he hitting the leg spinner uh, through cow corner or is he hitting the fast bowlers uh, <laughs> he's hitting everybody through cow corner with the power that you cannot imagine and so so you remember so uh, we we do this all the time right when, when we are bowling in the nets and because it's a competitive kind of uh, environment uh, in, in in college cricket and stuff like that so you would tell the batsman your field placement right yeah yeah and so you would tell the batsman that these these are the players that are going to position this is where i'm you know basically going to bowl to you and things like that so for sushan it used to be that i don't know if i ever told him in the nets that i would put two people in cow corner because i knew that no matter what you did he would go that way and he had the short arm jab kind of a thing that he would hit it towards that direction i would say i've got two people there if you hit it in the air you're out you yeah uh so but, but then that's something that's a, that's a memory that's etched in my mind so clearly that when i think about sushant marathe i think about you know okay the guy who can basically bowl to him outside off stump but he's going to hit you there uh, right over cow corner and 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 he did that with great great consistency so and and as i said in the earlier part of the episode as well he had so much power at that age too uh so you would say that okay i have put fielders there but he would take you on and hit you over so uh it, it's it's something that you know he, he, then he's got very strong forearms i would say i think he was being extremely kind firstly <laughs> i don't remember like consistently hitting over cow corner and also honestly like for the longest time in my career my technique wasn't the best so it just meant that because i was using my bottom hand a lot more in my batting just enable me to you know play over cow corner rather than playing to the offside a lot more that's a really so, good shan, that's a really good insight 
because you had a dominant bottom hand, you know. Yep. Playing it back. So, Jan, just a quick question. I mean, which innings of yours would make you proud, or which uh, performance? You know, it can be wicket keeping or uh, batting, which would make you proud of uh, yourself. You know, looking back at your career. You know, be it a Ranji Trophy, be it club cricket, even if it is college cricket. You know, what would make you proud looking back at your career now? Um, I'd say the top two innings that that I thought was well, the highlights of my first class career, uh, at least, were my one day hundred that I got against Baroda. They had a pretty impressive bowling lineup. They had Munaf Patel, Irfan Patan, Yusuf Patan. Uh, oh. This guy called Murtaza Vora, if I remember correctly. Um, so pretty impressive bowling lineup. I got a hundred against them, and then I got a hundred against um, UP in the in the four day Ranji Trophy, where they had R P Singh, uh, Bhuvaneshwar Kumar, uh, Piyush Chawla, Suresh Raina. I think uh, Praveen Kumar was also there. So it was, a, it was as good a bowling lineup as you could get um, at the Ranji Trophy level, at least. I've got a um, couple of people, by the way, who want to say hi to you. I've got messages on the side. One is uh, my friend Rock uh, from CCI. You know, Sandeep yeah. Kuldrajani. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, don't I don't know if you know him, but he sort of yeah, 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 yeah. He runs the cricket program there, right, at CCI for a few years. Um, yes. And then another one of uh, Prahlad's friends who is part of uh, Fans in Blue as well, who said he played with you at Mumbai under 15 level, Devendra Pawar. Yes. Yes. Next winner. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we would we were trying to get him to join today as well. He couldn't make it, but uh, you know. Uh, so they, these guys just wanted to say hello. Uh, I do want to build I, I, on. I, I took the leg spinner spot today. So. Yeah. Yeah. We have two. We have, we have one too many leg spinners uh, there. I, I do. I want to build on Vedang's question, which is, um, and I think we've probably you know at last uh, ten minutes or so wrap things up after that. But I do want to build on Vedang's question and kind of tie it to one of your answers before. Uh, maybe you kind of build, you know connect a, f- a few dots. One is, did you find that you know as you sort of grew as a player, learned from guys you played with in Ranji Trophy or IPL, um, and perhaps some of your better knocks in your later cricketing stages? Um, you know, did you find that you naturally developed sort of um, two to three go-to shots? And you kind of just played the percentage game as a lot of people talk about, or did someone kind of walk you through that um, and say, look, you know, you might not, I mean, just using your own words, which is you might not be the best cover driver, but what that's not necessary to achieve success at this level at, at any level, perhaps, you know, I mean, there's a famous um, sort of uh, tidbit about Sachin not playing the cover drive when he scored his 243 in Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess, um, you know, kind of, did that journey happen naturally for you? Did you learn and understand your own game? Or did someone give you that mentorship and kind of bring that out for you? Because I think like, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, not a perfect system in place, especially in India in terms of mentorship. So I'm curious as to what your experience was and perhaps could you suggest a better way for the kids coming up now? Um, I would say... <laughs> It's hard to answer that question, to be honest. Um, a good technique definitely helps because if you have your fundamentals right, it just means that you can build on that and then you can improvise, right? So let's look at a, a Rohit Sharma. Like earlier, uh, the reason that I feel he wasn't as consistent at the international level was because there were some, some minor technical glitches but now he's just got a more stable technical base, which is why you know he's the consistent player that we now know. Um, in terms of getting consistently big runs, I think it's just a matter of habit. Uh, no one can teach you how to get consistent hundreds. Uh, it's just something that you need to go through and almost figure out what works for you because there is no there's no set plan as such. No can no one can tell you. You know, this is how you bat from 10 to 20, or sorry, 0 to 20, and this is how you bat from 20 to 60, and then you pace out uh, from 60 to 100. It's, it's just not possible. So it's just what works for you and what's worked for you over the years, and then what works in that given situation. Um, 
but yeah as i said having a good technique definitely helps cricket still despite all the physical advancements i still feel it's a it's a game where um skills are uh, are the most important um so you know yeah again good technique is um is something that people should focus on at a younger age so so shashank have you have you ever considered uh, being part of a cricket setup to coach uh, people from perspective from the experience that you've gained or also from perspective that you know sometimes if you know oh i wish i had uh, that voice in my ear when i was at that stage uh, so do you feel that you want to be that person for somebody um yeah maybe like never say never uh, no such plans right now but if um, something comes up in the future and you know i feel the time is right yeah why not and it, you, you think it's uh, so much so much uh, more conducive for a person who's uh, played cricket in the mumbai circle to find that kind of a, an opportunity i see a lot of uh, you know ex cricketers setting up academies in mumbai coaching yeah. kids at a very very young level which is great because i think that uh, as you mentioned right it's not necessary for only uh, for you to learn your batsmanship from uh, you know the greats like sachin tendulkar or ricky ponting or the likes and i know i sure that there's a long list there but people finding it more relatable to the challenges you are facing as a cricketer and even you know today uh, coaching is kind of democratized with you know the internet right so yeah. you see yourself doing that in a in a uh, down uh, situation here doing it remotely you know <laughs> yeah i i don't think coaching can be taught i mean cricket can be taught remotely um as i said it's a very um, skills oriented game so it's not like you can you know coach someone this is how you should be getting your bat down or this is how you know you should be rolling your arm over it's just i don't think it's going to have the desired um desired results if you have like a virtual coaching session um having like being a mentor is something that i think is is a serious commitment on part of both parties um and i'll only take it up if you know i feel i have enough time to dedicate to to someone because that person would would be trusting me to you know guide him or her on the right path so i'll only take it up if i have that sort of bandwidth in in terms of time uh sushant building up on prahlad's question i mean just as an extension uh what would you want like you've gone through the grind basically all the way from college cricket to ranji to even an ipl i mean what would you and you already said that you would not mind coaching if the opportunity comes and if it's right for you so what would you try to bring in that one thing which you know you felt was missing throughout your, in the whole system which was missing throughout your journey in cricket uh you know what would you like to focus on which you fe- you feel that you know if this would have been there maybe me as a cricketer also would have grown and it would help the other cricketers also hmm um a few things but the most important for me i felt was just having um like clear lines of communication between you know selectors and the players or at times coaches and the players which you know which at times sadly during my time wasn't like weren't present but i see things are improving a lot now um i see that the lines between senior and junior players are, are blurring each day so everyone feels as much a part of the side as you know anyone else in the team so um i think things are getting better so so uh, okay. sorry if I, if i want to transition a little bit i will sneak in a cheeky question so uh, what's your opinion about rishabh pant and uh, whom do you see as the next big wicketkeeper batsman emerging from either the local circuit or you know even higher up so and you know just just feel free to give us your thoughts about that role uh, in the indian team or in the cricket team for the for that matter sure um rishabh pant is is one of the most talented guys i've seen man yeah some of his some of his knocks are unforgettable like the the knock he played against uh, mumbai indians if you remember where he hit bumrah all, all over the park which is sometimes something i had never seen um he's immensely talented i just think it's a matter of time before he gets his act together and 
ends up being a consistent player for india i hope that's the case for his sake and for india's sake in terms of wicket keepers um i don't think dinesh karthik's career is over uh, for the indian team i think there is still a chance of him of dk making a comeback and you know um st- solidifying his place as a as a um as a wicket keeper batsman because even though he is in his 30s he is as fit as as anyone else in the team so i don't think age should be a, a consideration in that regard um what about yeah, ms dhoni um yeah i mean first he'll have to dislodge dhoni as you rightly said so I'm not sure if dhoni stepping down anytime soon but in terms of um the wicket keepers for the future i would still i would still think dk and rishabh pant would be the two choices and if i were to ask you a little bit about the distant future uh, domestically would you see any anyone emerging from from the ranks in general in mumbai cricket for that matter um i'm not not particularly clued in with mumbai cricket for the last 4 or 5 years um but ishan kishan looks like a a promising guy um he's got that he's got he's got something about him where you know plays a fearless band of cricket his glove works pretty impressive as well um he's being coached by kiran more from what i understand uh, when he's with the mumbai indians and he's as good a wicket keeping coach as you ever going to get so he has all the resources in place and i think if he keeps a, a stable head on his shoulders i think he should be someone to look out for the future you talked a little bit about um punts innings i want to kind of uh focus it back on you which is um could you maybe walk us through one or two innings um that you witnessed either from the dugout or from the other end um which uh, kind of in your memory would be the most impressive knocks you've seen whether they were 100 or even sometimes you know like a, a memorable 70 or 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 40 for that matter but i just want to kind of pick your brain to two that come up in your mind uh, while you were playing either against you or with you mm, there are a few the first one would be um the 300 that rohit got um so his highest score even till now is a 300 that he got against gujarat uh in the ranji trophy and i was lucky enough to be at the other end for a majority of those in uh, that innings um it's it's some of the most unbelievable hitting i've seen uh, at any level like you you see rohit sharma and you think about the 263 that he played uh, that he got against sri lanka and all those sort of things but that innings was just incredible like i remember over, at the end of day 1 he was batting 140 and i was i think 102 or something like that uh the next morning he went on to get his double 100 and i was 105 so <laughs> he he was just hitting bowlers for fun that day and it, it's it's something it's an innings which i remember pretty vividly even now um the second innings um that i had witnessed would be So the 2009 Ranji Trophy finals that we won, uh, Abhishek Nair got a 50 in the second innings, which was crucial to us, um, you know, putting up uh, a, a decent enough total to defend. Um, it was a really tough pitch to bat on. Um, they had some quality bowlers, and he really played out of his skin to get those 50 or 60 runs that he got. So in terms of you know getting runs that actually matter. that was as good as it got um that's and, and i remember good. that that game watching that game so vividly and you know as you mentioned nayar playing that uh, kind of half flick of sunil joshi and manish pandey yeah. taking an absolute blinder at mid wicket yeah yeah and then then that whole uh, interaction with the crowd in mysore i, th- I think that that must be you know <laughs> uh, a riveting riveting experience yeah it was it was a fascinating game to be a part of Interesting. Sunil Joshi was still playing those years, huh? Sunil Joshi was playing. It was Manish Pandey's first season, if I remember correctly. And and, and if, if you can actually, you know, you should, we we should just Google when whenever you get time, just Google that catch that Manish Pandey took to dismiss Nair. It was really unreal. I'm pretty I sure that they're on YouTube. I would be very surprised if it's not because it'll be a real shame if it's not there. It's probably the best catch I've ever seen on a cricket field. 
Wow. I remember I got in Salil Joshi uh, LB in like a, a sort of a, a kind of a tournament we play here in Philadelphia where he was the chief guest. And uh, yeah, so it was, um, you know, it was one of those where like the the umpire was like raising his finger and then he realized that the chief guest <laughs> was batting at the other end. And then after that, he, he, and he sort of proceeded to dispatch me for three fours in a row when he wasn't given out. Uh, and it wasn't one of those debatable ones. It was, it was, you know, pretty much like dead on. But uh, I mean, you could tell like the guy was like international cricketer was just, you know, having fun uh, playing with us uh, mortals. Um, anyways, uh, the one, my, my sort of last question to you and maybe the other guys of other ones would be, uh, Rohit Sharma, you talked about being in the other end, you scored 144 yourself um, and he scored 300. But um, what do you think sets him apart um, from other players, obviously the one that comes to mind is that the, the amount of time he has on the ball. And, yeah. you know, in, in New Zealand, uh, Martin Crowe, who's one of the best batsmen you've ever seen, used to always say, if you see the ball early, you tend yeah. to have more time. Um, is it as simple as that? Or or is there any magic to Rohit Sharma that, you know, the non-striker can tell us that we don't see? Look, um, he definitely is incredibly talented, right? Um, if people talk a lot about Rohit Sharma being incredibly talented, but not a lot of people talk about the hard work he puts in. He's a very hardworking guy. Uh, he's incredibly self-confident, and that's something that's been the case throughout his career. Like I first played with Rohit when um, um, I was the captain of the Mumbai under-19 side. Uh, we played the whole season. We won the one-day championship that year. And even though he had a kind of a patchy season, you could always see that there was that that self-confidence within the guy that, you know, he knew that he was going to make it big. And that's something that's always um, stayed with him. Um, and then once he tasted that success with the India A side, you could see that change in his work ethic as well. Uh, so with him now, it's become a classic case of talent meets hard work and dedication. Um, which is a sure shot recipe for success. Look, and I'm not going to shy away from the fact that he's incredibly talented, but it wasn't like when I saw him for the first time, I thought he was the most talented guy that I'd ever seen. He's definitely worked on his game a lot. Um, he has become smarter about the way he approaches his batting. Uh, he's become a lot more mature as well. And Success does bring with it a certain level of self-confidence and maturity, man, which, he, which now you can see that he exhibits in plenty. So, so Sushant, to, to build on that, let's talk about the other end of the spectrum where you saw somebody and you thought that this guy is you know, marked for greatness and you thought that he did not or he or she did not get uh, what they could have in terms of their potential. Um... It's a tough one. <laughs> Definitely will ruffle a few feathers there, but um, I would say, and I hope he forgives me for this, but um, he's a good friend of mine, Paul, Paul Valtati. He had that one um, incredible season in the IPL, but I don't think he did justice to his talent. Um, he was one of the most talented people I'd ever seen, um, but didn't really end up, um, as I said, fulfilling his potential. Um, can't think of anyone else. Maybe Raidu. Uh, for whatever reasons, again, and he's had a, a, a lot more successful career. Uh, end up, ended up playing for India, got a few runs for India as well, but he should have been like talked about as one of the greats of Indian cricket. Uh, he was that talented. Really, really amazing batsman. Just building on both both Nikhil's as well as Pralad's question, Rasushant, how much do you feel luck plays a part? I mean, you know, they say destiny in all of this because it's so much to do with, you know, a lot of things falling at the right place at the right time. Do you think really luck plays a part or it is just that, you know, if you're hardworking, talented and get all the right things in line, then, you know, you should be where you should be? It's a great question. I think luck plays a major part. Um, and again, um, people are going to have different answers for this. Um, but just from a personal standpoint, I remember um, we used to have the, a tournament called Champions League where right. the top three teams of the IPL would play against different uh, yes. countries. Yes. We had 
um, we had this tournament in Raipur one year. I think it was 2014 itself. And I was supposed to start the uh, tournament for Mumbai Indians, where I was told that you're going to play like, the first two or three games, no matter what. And two days before the tournament started, I tore my hamstring during a training session. So it was one of those one of those cases where you know had things worked out slightly differently, I would have ended up playing for Mumbai Indians for sure in that tournament. And then who knows? Uh, right. I know I wouldn't have played for India. Don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying that I could have ended up having a, a bit of a goal um, in the IPL. Um, so yeah, I, I do think luck plays a part, but you got to be talented. Plus, you got to be extremely hardworking, and then just hope that you know you're lucky enough to perform where it really matters. I suppose. Okay, All right, great. I think uh, that's that's our time for today, guys. Um, you know, uh, Sushant. Amazing uh, having you here with us. Uh, I think Thanks everyone who everyone who's sort of seen this uh, would have really learned a lot about everything from the age group cricket all the way to the IPL. And I think it's unique, in my opinion, to have um, a perspective of someone who's kind of gone through the grind. You know, has um, played with um, some of the best players in the world. You know, the Sachins and the Hasis and the Rohit Sharma's. Um, kind of seen them train. Um, as an insider in that environment, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a very unique perspective. And so, um, you know, we truly appreciate your time and, uh, you know, um, we'll hope to keep in touch with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. Good to see you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sushant. I, I really like your forthright answers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes.